if you could only have one lens, which one would you choose? It's a question I get asked a lot, and my answer is always, I shoot in the range of 16 millimeters up to 200. But my one lens answer has always really been the 24 to 70. And in almost all genres of photography, that will still be my answer. It's great for portraits. You can do a little bit of macro with it. You can do landscape with it. You can do pretty much everything in that focal range. But when I'm looking at my portfolio for the last couple of years, my actions say something different. Now, I think now my one lens solution, especially, or at least for landscape photography, is now this, the 70 to 200. A wide angle lens like this, the 16 to 35, is often sort of touted as the thing for landscape photographers. But the 70 to 200 opens up a new exciting realm of opportunities to create some very unique landscape photographs in a world where now a lot of the big wide vistas have become very famous and very well photographed. So coming up with anything new and original can be really hard with that. But with this, it's really easy. It's exciting. And in this video, I want to get out into a couple of different places across the UK and show you what can be done with this lens and give you some examples of things you can do to create some truly unique photography. And it's not even that expensive, this lens. It's light, so it's easy to hike around and yeah, it's affordable as well. And pretty much every manufacturer makes a lens in this range. So let's get this one lens packed up for a trip across the UK and yeah, let's just go and do it. So I would love it if you'd come with me. Let's go. So I've come to this location, which is absolutely perfect for the 70 to 200 mil lens. When I look behind me there and in a place like this, it feels amazing. It's these rolling hills and there's some beautiful depth in what I can see, but it's actually really difficult to get a really good landscape photograph. And the reason for that is because every time we're doing landscape photography, we're battling with the fact that we are bringing the 3D world down in to the 2D world. So we automatically lose that depth that we see with our own eyes and brain. And in a location like this, it's absolutely full of depth. And it's that I need to try and put into my image. But if I just whack a wide angle lens onto the camera and shoot what I can see essentially, you always end up in a place like this with a very flat horizon line. And if you look behind my face now, you'll see that flat line in this image. And I'm not a big fan of that in my landscape photographs. It's why I love mountainous photography so much because you just get those shapes and peaks all the way through the image. But having that flat line, whether it's on the rule of thirds or not, I'm not a big fan of, unless it is seascape photography because we expect that when we're stood at the sea. It's that classic flat horizon line, so it works. But that's the beauty of the 70 to 200 lens because we can whack it on the camera and pull out those beautiful details. Look at, I mean, look at that now. I've got to shoot that. I'm already focused in. I'll talk through the composition in a minute, but look at that light. I'm in at 200 and just look at that shape behind me. It's so beautiful as we wind through that valley with that beautiful, beautiful S-curve. And with this light dipping in and out from behind the cloud, it's just looking incredible. So I'm right in at 200 millimeters at the moment to really make that part of the image. And it's about the contrast of that soft light against the shadowy areas and then the brighter areas. And that really enhances the depth in the image, which is what I want to put back into that 2D image. And as it winds its way through, we've got those intersecting triangles all the way through. Triangles, like I've said so many times before, work so well in images. 
And that's what I'm doing here, using those triangles all through that valley with that S-curve leading line going through it. Because I don't like that horizon line though, I'm not even having any sky in this image at all. So it's actually going to be a fairly artistic type image, I guess. I don't like saying that, but I think that's gonna what it, kind of what it's going to be. There will be some depth in there, but it will... The sense of scale might be reduced, I don't know actually, because we've still got some trees in the distance. I just, I am absolutely excited about what's going on here, I really am. Let me just have... Ah, oh, the lights there, soft light, is just coming out from behind the cloud now. That's what I've found is working... Oh, that's so nice. That's what I'm, I've found is working best, is those, like I said, the moment when the light's direct but soft. It's not... Oh, that's just perfect. Yes. Down there in the valley, there's also this spiral sort of shape dug out into the grass, and that's adding an even extra bit of interest to the scene. So that's down in the left-hand side of the frame, and then we work around that curve, intersecting triangles. Great light, no sky in it. The shape is just lovely, and if I take a step back from the screen on the camera, I can see that even more, and it's working so nicely. I'm not quite sure how I'm gonna process this yet because the green, I'm not a huge fan of. I'm thinking black and white. I'm thinking a strong bluish tone with a split toning, I don't know. It'll be interesting to experiment around with this one. The thing with this 7200 lens, because you can get in closer, it's so much more zoomed in than your eyes see. You're looking at the light, it's working so well right now. You're looking at the light, where does the light work? And you can get in close on it like that. And in a landscape like this, which is amazing, like I said, but difficult to photograph, especially with a wide angle. There's no mountains, there's no interesting clouds even at the moment, it's a very blue sky back there. Nothing would be working if it wasn't for this 70 to 200 lens and that's working really, really well at the moment. I'm chuffed to bits with that. And it's a similar story doing this kind of thing, picking out detail from another wide, otherwise wide scene that works so well in this kind of landscape, but also will give you those unique shots in places like the Lake District, places that are very famous, wide views, but you get in tighter with this lens and you can pick out something pretty special. And that's what I'm gonna do now as we transport forwards in time to the Lake District. So I've made it to the Lake District and I am running a workshop today. I have Russ with me and we're having a great day. He is a big fan of waterfalls though. So we are currently at this very, very impressive waterfall. However, I have a slight issue with waterfalls in that when you're stood in front of one as impressive as, as this, it's really difficult to do it justice because you have those natural leading lines of the water going up the fall but then very often and this is a, the case here you end up in a spot towards the top of the waterfall where nothing then really happens it's where your eye is led it's your pathway through the image to nothing essentially just a few trees or a very uninteresting sky so by using the 70 to 200 i'm going to do a similar shot to what i've just done in I'm picking out details of this otherwise exciting landscape that a wide angle lens just wouldn't do justice to. I'm focusing at the moment, or thinking about, when trying to come up with the composition, I'm thinking about texture, I'm thinking about tone, and I'm thinking about shape, and trying to formulate them into something that's going to be interesting to the eye. Again though, it's not going to be a classic landscape image, it's going to be and as much as I don't like it, again, it's something a little bit more artistic and thoughtful and subtle maybe. It isn't gonna be an Instagram banger, but when it's printed, put into series maybe with other images like it, it will be something quite good. Now, 
it's quite an interesting way I'm having to do it because I don't have as much gear with me today as I would normally have. I'm in at 200 millimeters and there's this little bit of water where there's, it's essentially minimizing or, what's the word, minimalizing this scene. So taking one small bit of the waterfall and blowing that up into a bigger image using the 7200. So I'm focused in at 200 millimeters right in on a small portion of the waterfall where there's two different tones of rock. There's a few leaves stuck in behind the water there. And then you've got that interesting flow of the water. I've got the 10 sup filter on the front of the lens as well, because I wanna just smooth that water out. I don't want detail in that water. Like I said, it's all about texture and it's the texture of the rock juxtaposed against the smoothness of the water that I think is gonna create the interest in this image. I am then, because, then because there's some light or the sun is just above us here, I want to then take some of the sheen off the water, which you need a polarizer for, but I don't have the bracket to go on the front of the polarizer. So I'm gonna to have to hold this one right in front of the lens, which is going to be a little bit tricky, but I think it'll work because I have my composition set I think I'm gonna go for a square crop as well to make this really work. I'm at F8 because it's gonna be quite a flat image. There's not really much depth in it. And then I'm going for a five second exposure. So let's try this. So there, and then hold that filter in front on the two second timer. Try not to move the camera at all. Let's have a look at that. I mean, it's gonna need some post-processing. I'm imagining kind of putting in quite a strong vignette on it pushing that contrast to emphasize the difference between the water and the rock. And again, I think that's gonna be quite interesting. It's one of those lovely detail shots that I'm always encouraging people to take that link your day up to the wider vistas that you might end up taking. But standalone, I still think that's gonna work really, really nicely. So yeah, I just love it when you can do that with the 7200. You, you just, this just simply wouldn't work with the wider lens. And picking out details of the landscape with this lens is really what it's all about. Good stuff. So the beauty of this lens is it can be just so useful in so many different types of landscape as well. So I wanted to give you a few more ideas about what you can do with this lens in these different landscapes. And to do that, we're gonna look at a few examples here. So straight into the computer here, and this is the first one. This is a tree from uh, Wales, as I'm climbing up a mountain in Wales. And this is a good example of where if you just simply can't get anywhere near the subject you want to take, there was quite a big ravine, a big drop between me and this tree and it just allowed me to get in closer to frame that tree use that contrast to make that tree pop out from that cliff face i'm going to go through through this very quickly so here's another example and this is seascape photography this time and it's allowing us getting in a bit further a bit closer to use objects that are more distant from us from where our feet are and bring them into the foreground of an image. The foreground of your image doesn't have to be right in front of you. So the rocks are forming this foreground. We've then got that beautiful water and then the sky, just a nice, clean, simple image using that lens. Next one. <laughs> now I love this kind of thing. It's using this lens in the mountains to get in and pull out detail and texture of those mountainous scenes. This is from the top of Great Gable in the Lake District. It's one of the bigger mountains, but the view is very well known. And if I was to take a wide view, it wouldn't be particularly unique. But by using this lens, getting in close on that scene with that sky, with the colors and the beautiful soft light on those mountains, this is pretty much a unique shot from a very popular spot and in the mountains. That's what I love about this lens. Here's another example. This is shot from the top of Lufrig Fell, another very popular spot, but with that light, with the weather conditions, 
getting in tight on this lens or with this lens, again, I think that's something fairly unique that would be very difficult to recreate. Love it. I love these kind of mountainous shots. Here's another example. This was from the other day when I actually filmed a bit with the waterfall. Didn't film anything with this one. This is a handheld panorama at 200 millimeters. And it was just an off the cuff type of thing as we stopped by Buttermere Lake. And I quite like it. I like the moody feel with that light. And you can do that with this lens. So if you're shooting handheld, at 200 millimeters. A good rule of thumb is to double your shutter speed to make sure you're getting those sharp shots. So 200 millimeters, you want one four hundredth of a second shutter speed. These days though, with image stabilization and IBIS, you can get a lot lower than that, but you can be sure you're gonna get sharp shots if you double the focal length panoramas. Handheld with this can be very effective because you're filling your frame with the detail. And here's another one. Again, using that 200 millimeter focal length to get closer to the sun, to make the sun bigger in your image. And this is from a mountaintop on a sunrise, lovely lines through it, as you can see here. And yeah, it's just lets that sun be bigger in the frame. And then about 20 minutes later, I got this shot again from the mountaintop. So this is uh, there's more depth in this image. We've got that S-curve working its way through to that distant lake there. And that, again, is just shows the versatility of this lens from having that sunrise with just that quite flat image to this one with loads of depth in it. It's so versatile. You've got quite a good range between 70 and 200. Here's another one. Just getting in close on the detail of the shot. That beautiful sky. One of my favourite shots of all time. A once in a lifetime moment. Again, captured with this lens. It's getting me excited just thinking about it. Here's another one from the top of Walla Crag. I've talked about this one many times before, but it's just allowed me to get in close to make this minimal image using all that cloud down on the lake, looking at it from on top and creating something again, I think, relatively unique because in the same spot using a wide angle lens this is what we got and that's fine i like it it's nice colors interesting with the cloud but i don't think it's anywhere near as good as that one and that's the point is that that's a very common spot even with a bit of a cloud inversion it's still there's other shots like that but that previous one is unique and it's all thanks to this lens and a little bit of skill, maybe. And here's another one. This was shot on a sunrise. And again, it's just allowed me to use those trees, which were quite distant from me, but use those as my foreground using that reflection. And I've then got that slightly layered type image up into that sunrise with that nice blue sort of morning misty feel. And yeah, I mean, uh, again, it's just a shot that I couldn't have done with a wide angle lens because I couldn't have got any closer to those trees to still use them in the foreground like that. And here is another example. Again, one of my favorite images over the last couple of years that I've taken, this beautiful, subtle, misty morning, which I call this curiosity. And again, it was shot with this. So it's just getting in a little bit closer to show the detail in the distance. And you could have shot something nice with a wide angle lens from that point, but I just like the detail and it's allowed me to do something a little bit different, a little bit more unique, again, with this lens from a very, very popular spot. And that's pretty much what I love about this lens. And I think you will too, if you shoot in this focal range, it opens up such an, a big new area of landscape photography for you. And you take this lens into those sort of very, very popular spots, put this on, get in close, pick details out of that landscape, and you will come away with unique shots almost every time because they're not the classic wide view. You're being more artistic, you're thinking about it like a photographer much more deeply, and you can come away with some amazing images. This one as well is not particularly expensive. It's an F4. If you go for the F2.8, it will be much, much bigger. Although that the 2.8 lenses are beautiful, this F4 is pretty small, it's pretty light, 
and the image quality is still very good because with most landscape photography, we're never really shooting below f5.6, f8, so the, the f4 lenses will do you just fine. And this is not too expensive at all. You can get them secondhand for about 400 pounds, if not a little bit less. I hope you found this very useful and it's inspired you to go out and capture some of these types of images and explore the landscape with this increased focal range. What I do as well is I sometimes just use my phone, zoom in on that to give you an idea because you're looking at a focal length much longer than your eyes, you're using your phone to get in close before you whack your, whip your camera out can be very useful. I do that quite regularly as well. So anyway, I think I've talked for long enough. I'll see you on another one very, very soon. Make sure you check out the Raw Room, all the tutorials on there if you haven't done so already, and I'll see you very soon. I'm Adam, this is First Man Photography, out.